I'm not going to make much of an opening statement. Um, but I did want to make sure and remind everyone uh, the, about the public hearings we will be having. Again, uh, these hearings, November 16th and 17th in Santa Fe, New Mexico, January 11th, 12th in Miami, Florida, February 3rd and 4th in Portland, Oregon. Yesterday, I omitted February 18th and 19th, 2016 in Birmingham, Alabama, March 2nd and 3rd, 2016 in San Francisco, California, April 11th and 12th of 2016 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and finally Mar May 16th and 17th, uh, 2016 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. This morning, our first panel is views of defenders on training. Um, our subcommittee members are Dr. Robert Rucker, uh, the Honorable Mitchell Goldberg, uh, the Honorable Dale Fisher, and uh, Catherine Rowe. And our panel participants are Ms. Tina Hunt, the Federal Public Defender from the Middle District of Georgia, Lisa Freeland, the Federal Public Defender from the Western District of Pennsylvania, Carlos Williams, the Federal Public Defender Bender from the Southern District of Alabama, and Aries, Amy Cirignano, the panel attorney from the District of New Mexico. Um, we'll go ahead and start with opening statements, and we'll start with you, Ms. Hunt. Um, <clears throat> I think that as a group, before we came, we all discussed what would be topics relevant to CJA training, and I would like to talk to the, to the committee about the difficulty of training the CJA panel in the rural areas. My district is a very rural area. We have two major cities, um, and the rest of the district is comprised of, although we have five divisions, um, the other three divisions are rural areas. Because of that, it's very difficult to reach out to the panel and train them. Um, in any sort of meaningful way. We use a website, we use mailings, we use, we have a protected forum on our website to answer questions. We fill phone calls on a daily basis, but I feel that that's not enough to train the panel, and the judges in my district don't feel that it's enough to train my panel. Um, I also live in a district in which we actually have no model CJA plan, so that makes it even more difficult because in my district, you can be on the panel, you are technically on the panel, on the CJA panel, um, whether or not you're qualified. Uh, every person who's admitted to the bar of the Middle District of Georgia is considered to be on the panel. Um, and that includes whether or not you're dead because they don't strike your name off after you die. <laughs> so. As you can see, it's very difficult to get a meaningful list of those lawyers who are practicing routinely in the Middle District of Georgia. Um, with the five divisions we have, three there are magistrates who sit in three of the divisions who assign all, who have the responsibility of assigning and managing the panel. My office does not manage the panel. Um, we have recently come to the point where um, I think the judges have come to the realization that we have a problem with our panel, with the quality of our panel, with the training of our panel, and they are working on setting up a program, uh, some, at, at least picking up many of the areas of the um, model CJA plan, but I don't foresee that happening because it's Georgia and we're slow um, for at least another 18 months to begin with. Uh, my office has only been open 10 years, only been accepting cases 9 years. What we have learned is that the quality of representation has gone up tremendously in the district because of the office. Because I think that the panel lawyers are now seeing here are some of the things that you can do to fight um, in your cases and things you need to look for in your cases. And then of course we do have a a helpline you can call in and, and we do make regular appearances in court with them so they see the what we can do in terms of training. One of the problems in a rural area with the lack of training also concerns the lack of resources um, and the training that they need to learn how to get and use resources to assist their clients. 
So that is something that we are working on is putting together a bank of resources they can use that the judges <clears throat> would approve um, payments for so that they can do a better job representing their clients. We have some very good CJA lawyers in my district. We also have some very poor ones in my district. And the magistrates don't just go down the list. They do try to um, fit the lawyer to the case to the best of their ability. But we have recently hit a number of cases in which we have 35 defendants or more. And that has really created quite the strain on the court um, because many of the lawyers coming in to take co-defendants on these uh, mega cases do not have the training that they need in order to be able to deal with the cases that we're dealing with. So this is a real struggle in my district. It's a rural district. Thank you. Miss um, Freeland, I believe you're next. Yeah, and um, thank you, uh, Judge Cardone, and really thank all of you for inviting us and specifically focusing some of your attention during this study on training because it recognizes what an important part training is to providing quality representation under the Criminal Justice Act. Um, my personal statement, I focused in on a couple of what I consider to be one of the challenges that we're facing, which is training with respect to race and ethnicity issues and bias in the criminal justice system. And I'll talk a little bit about that this morning, but I also wanted to talk more broadly about some other issues as well, um, knowing that we would have time to discuss maybe some questions that you might have later about those issues. Um, you know, first, I was a little bit skeptical of this study um, when it came out, having been a survivor of sequestration and a recent work measurement study, I thought, you know, how could we be studied anymore? Um, and, and what would be the impact of this study? But then thinking about, um, you know, some of the impacts on the program, including training, and in some ways particularly training, it seemed like this study came along at just the right time. Um, because I think we are still suffering under some of the issues that led both to the sequestration and to the budget crisis, I mean, and to the work measurement study, which was the budget. And the budget has a huge impact on training. Um, we, can, we can train lawyers, and we've provided you in our background statement with some of the, the, of the description and the goals of the program and all of the programs that we've offered and that are delivered both to panel attorneys and federal defenders. But if the lawyers aren't able to get the resources to carry out that training in the courtroom, the, the, the training itself um, is ineffectual. Um, I'll give you an example from my district. Um, not too long ago, they, re they released statistics about how often investigators were used in cases. And I think in my district, where the panel gets 25% of the cases, which is hundreds of cases, um, there were 12 instances where panel attorneys retained an investigator. Um, as compared to a federal defender office, <clears throat> excuse me, where every case is staffed with a staff investigator. And so we can, <clears throat> we can have trainings which highlight and try to urge panel attorneys to follow best practices, to engage investigators, to engage experts, to put on mitigation at sentencing, but if they can't get the resources in the courtroom, it, it, it stalls. Um, in particular, I think even defenders have been caught in something of a catch-22 um, following the sequester. In many offices where money was tight, training money was the first money to be put aside for something else, and I'm sure Judge Fisher, you're shaking your head, and you're aware of that <clears throat> in your district, and so we found ourselves in something of a catch-22, and as long as this kind of um, cloud of the budget crisis hangs over us. I think these are choices, difficult ones, that lawyers are having to make in their cases. Um, and and it, it's kind of the end of the line of the training. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we, In my personal statement, I did talk a little bit about one of the challenges. Tina's identified one of the challenges. Um, and I think both Amy and Carlos are going to do the same, which is really confronting issues of race and ethnicity 
both as it relates to our representation in our cases, but also as it impacts our hiring and the diversity of our staff. And we had two training programs this year, one that was put on for federal defenders, capital and non-capital, a small program, and another larger program that was really targeted towards CJA attorneys, but also defender staff was able to attend, which is often the case with the training programs that are designed for panel attorneys when there's space available, defender staff is able to attend those as well. And one of the things that, I mean, I personally learned um, from the program that I attended was that we have a long way to go in this area and that if we want to make any headway, this is going to be training that we're going to have to offer um, these same programs in the years to come and we're going to have to incorporate the issues that were covered in those programs and all of our training programs. And I'm happy to say that there appears to be a commitment among defenders to do just that. Um, we're planning our federal defender and administrative officer um, training program for February and the issue of implicit bias as it relates to hiring is front and center on that agenda. And so um, I expect that as we move forward with the advanced defender training programs and others in the defender system that this type of training will be offered. Um, training also impacts our ability to address a lack of diversity both on our panels and on our staffs because, I, again, example in my office, my, my office is relatively small. I mean, we now have 12 assistant federal defenders, but for most of the 10 years that I've served as the chief defender, we were around seven or eight lawyers. And so it was very difficult to take on lawyers with less experience. You know, for years, our ads ran with three plus years federal criminal justice experience, and that's just awfully hard to find. Um, they're either in other defender offices um, and willing to move or you're not going to find it. And the same is true for, the, for recruiting attorneys to the CJA panel. So the ability to offer training, continually robust training, impacts our ability both in defender offices to bring on younger, perhaps lesser experienced and more diverse staff, and likewise for the CJA panel. Um, in our district, we do have um, a CJA plan. It's under revision right now. Um, the final draft is before the circuit. It has been approved by the Board of Judges. Um, but one of the things that we changed in our CJA plan is we added both a mentoring panel and a, C and a training panel. Um, and the mentoring panel is really for younger lawyers that don't, you know, maybe have some state criminal experience or don't have any experience in this area at all, and they can come in and be mentored by one of our um, CJA panel lawyers and, the, and work as a second chair for, I think it's um, over a period of three cases, however long that takes. I mean, it could take several years. Um, and the, the training panel is for... Um, more experienced attorneys who might not want to be mentored but also need the experience in federal criminal practice and they can also work with a panel attorney to be trained in that area. Um, in my opinion, if we are going to increase diversity either in our offices or um, on our panels, we're going to also need to increase um, the amount of money that we spend on training likely would have to increase the sta staff of the training branch and defender services. I mean, you, we prov provided you with the programs that are offered. I mean, that's just about all that the staff that's available right now can do. <coughs> we won't be able to provide additional training to panel attorneys or defender staff or in regional areas or in local areas where the defender is not doing that without um, uh, additional staff to plan those trainings and in additional money to spend on them. Um, finally, I think, you know, I give you an example from another example from, from my district. Um, we do train our panel, um, but we recently, as I said, are amending our CJA plan, and it took great effort to get in our plan um, requirements, training requirements, both for eligibility for admission to the panel and for reappointment. And it currently stands that to be admitted to the panel in the Western District of Pennsylvania, within a year of your application, you have to have had one two-hour program on federal sentencing and one two-hour program on some other area of federal defense. And if you have that, you can be admitted to the panel in the Western District of Pennsylvania. We did increase the, um, the requirement for reappointment. And for reappointment, um, which it, it's, it's kind of odd, but for reappointment, you have to have eight hours of criminal defense training, including two in sentencing. 
and you have to attend um, the programs that are put on by the federal defender. It was purposefully left a little bit vague. It doesn't say every program that we put on or one per year, but in each year of your three-year term in the Western District of Pennsylvania, you have to have this eight hours of training. And oddly, there's it's it's ruffled some feathers because I think that it the, to be on the panel now requires more training than it, to be a lawyer in Pennsylvania. So, um, but you know that that's another challenge that we face with making training requirements a part of the CJA plans. Is that you know then you run up against some of the state requirements, and attorneys are used to getting the number of CLEs, and they've got their plan, and um, and it's going to cost our CJA panel lawyers more to get these credits, um, and uh, that's a hardship for them, particularly under the circumstances that they're practicing right now. Um, next is Mr. Williams. Good morning, and thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you today. I will focus uh, my efforts. I assume that the, the committee would have read my statement, so I would focus my efforts on uh, that aspect of uh, training uh, <clears throat> that I've essentially learned or become familiar with through my training of CJ lawyers and federal de defenders throughout the country. Uh, as I said in my statement, I am involved every year in either the Santa Clara death penalty uh, sentencing workshop or and and the Andrea Taylor sentencing workshop. And what I've experienced in in both of those trainings is that generally lawyers don't come to their cases with a good sense of who their clients is. They just don't know them. They know the case, they know the guidelines, they may know the law, they may know what the, what, what the sentencing range is, and they're very familiar with that, but they don't know the client. And whether you're doing it in capital or whether you're doing it in a non-capital sense, as, as the court recently observed, ours is a system of pleas. We know where we're going to end up. We know that we're going to be at sentencing. And, and in order to effectively represent somebody at sentencing, particularly when we consider the influence of the guidelines, it is critical that the lawyers really get to know who their clients are. The next reason for that is that we know that 50% or close to 50% of all defendants have mental health problems, which may in fact impact how their case is resolved, uh, which require yet another set of specialties that many lawyers and many lawyer offices are not equipped to deal with, including federal defenders. Uh, I know that we're moving in that direction, uh, but we need, uh, particularly because of the, the stakes in federal cases are so high, to really get people who can, number one, identify those kinds of problems in our clients, and number two, then begin to discuss how to deal with it within the context of the case. That requires some specialized knowledge. That requires a different kind of approach. Really, it requires a shift, a cultural shift on the part of lawyers. It will require a cultural shift on the part of the bench. It will require a, a cultural shift generally of all of those involved in, 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 in dealing with these cases. And, and I say this because in my own experience, I've seen where this is effective. And it's effective for very big reasons. The federal sentencing guidelines had the effect, as I say in my statement, of flattening, of making the defendant one-dimensional, uh, of essentially creating an abstraction where judges would, would look down the guidelines or consider the guidelines, but not necessarily the person. And in that sense, it, it was a dehumanizing process. By focusing on the life and the circumstances of the clients, we, we, we inject back into the process the humanity of the person coming before the court in its full sense. So that when you judge the person, you don't judge the offense and the criminal history without consideration of the context in which this person came to that point in his life. Uh, that should be the goal and that should be where we, 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 should, we should focus our attention. And it's a critical thing, as I said, because the anchoring effect of the guideline is pernicious on federal defenders, on lawyers of all ilk. It has the effect of essentially focusing people on the guidelines to the exclusion 
of the person. And, and, and dealing with the person is a hell of a lot more difficult than the guidelines. You run into a number of things, cultural issues, racial issues, uh, uh, trauma uh, that affects and, and, and really leads to, to many of the things that we see. I mentioned the ACE reports, the ACE uh, study rather, uh, which, which teaches us that many, many of our clients really come to us with many traumas. And many of these traumas often lead to conflicts with law enforcement, often lead to what we eventually see in court. And there's no reason why that history should not also be a factor that, that, that should be considered at sentencing. In fact, it's required by law. It's required by both statutory law and case law. That's the direction that I see us moving in. That's the direction that I see as being necessary. But yet still, time and time again, when we, when we teach, we have difficulty. Uh, uh, and, and we ask people to bring. They bring their cases. And basically, what we do in these seminars is we tell them, leave the guideline book at home. We're not going to talk about the guidelines at all. We want to talk about your client. And we want to know what story you're going to tell at sentencing with your client. And we help them through that process. We've seen the letters come back from judges, from the participants, who, who tell us what the results are, what the reaction was. Sometimes the courts don't want to hear it. But sometimes, and many, many, and many more times, we get positive result, results back from, from that experience. It will also influence the rate of recidivism to the extent that we can confront the real problems that these people have. And of course, it can lead to less, uh, 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 the lowering rather, of sentences, which is of course uh, the, our main goal in, in making sure that the sentence that the person receives is actually not only fits the crime, but the person and the circumstances that that person find themselves in. Uh, I cannot overestimate the importance of this. Uh, uh, for me, it's been a revealing process. It's been a learning process. I'm much more excited now in my 20 plus years of practice about what I'm doing because I've learned in teaching and in listening and, and, in, and in learning what, what the process of mitigation is. You don't go to one seminar and you learn it once and for all. It's a process that matures as the lawyer matures. And it's, there's a reason for that because, because each individual is unique. And the court recognized that in Kuhn, that each individual is unique, the human experience is different. And so we learn as, as we accumulate knowledge about the different people that we, that we encounter and the different stories that we hear and the different stories that we tell. Uh, so, so that's my focus. That's what I want us to focus on. And all I would say is, is that, that it's, it is also more important because we see uh, that race has been a factor, both in terms of what the, the guidelines have garnered, which is the mass incarceration of many Americans, the mass incarceration of many African and other, other Americans of, of color. And, and in many of those cases, it was simply their history and their offense level which led to that sentence. And the guidelines, the guidelines uh, saw as irrelevant the kind of stories that I'm saying we have to tell. Booker has, has changed that and, 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 and actually changed the direction of, of, of our sentencing laws in the right direction. And so the life and circumstances of each individual is now back in play. But you don't get that from many attorneys. They still, they still see the guidelines as, as the, 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 the primary thing that they have to address, the primary issue that they have to deal with. And, and I think that that is wrong. I know that that is wrong. While, while we do have to address it, while we do have to calculate it, there's much more to each story than the guidelines tell us. And the only way to, uh, to really address that is to tell the story. Once that happens, I get the feeling when I go before the court, 
I'm not just having a conversation about numbers. I'm having a conversation about a person. And, 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 uh, and that's my goal in sentencing, and that's, we hope, that's what we hope to teach. Now, I would love, and, and ever since you know, I learned early on what, what, what uh, Justice Kennedy talked about, that, that, we all, that, that, that all of these cases end up at sentencing, I learned early on that that's what it was about. And I learned early on of offices that hired MSWs, Masters in Social Works, uh, uh, into their office to identify some of the kind of mental health issues and to, to give us the kind of social histories we would then bring to the court. <clears throat> I've been hoping someday that I would hire such a person. I did hire somebody, not with that degree, but with those skills once, and it has revolutionized the way we practice, the kind of information we bring to the court and the results we see from our efforts in my district. And I'm in the Southern District of Alabama. And, and in the Southern District of Alabama, it's a very conservative district. They, 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 they hew very closely to the guidelines. But when we tell these stories, we see the results. And we know that it works. It is going to be, it is going to be a challenging thing to train uh, lawyers to do this because of the shift in culture that's required and many many lawyers don't see this as part of their work they say I'm not a social worker we get that all the time as we teach when they go through the process they see differently that it is a part of what we need to be about and things we need to, to learn in order to represent our clients effectively so that's really all I would like to, to say here uh, today, I, I'm, I'm remiss. One more, one more point. Uh, I started talking about how race has been a factor in sentencing and the defendants being incarcerated. Uh, race is also an issue when you come to, when you meet a defendant and you can see the difference between how, say, they respond to me as I come in and, and, a, and a lawyer who's not of the same culture or who's not of the same race. That happens. I speak Spanish. I was born in Panama. Uh, so when I, when, I, when I approach my clients who speak Spanish, it's the same. It's a very similar kind of effect. I can immediately uh, have and reach them and earn their trust in a way that somebody who does not speak their language can't. But race in this history plays such a critical part in this country. Uh, but, but getting that conversation, uh, getting that conversation started is always difficult because it feels like opening old wounds. Uh, 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 so the diversity issue that Lisa talked about, both in terms of staff uh, and, 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 and being able to address some of these issues, are some of the challenge that we, challenges that we face when we approach and when we have this cultural shift to talking about the client's life. You can't talk about the life and race, uh, uh, the life of African Americans without discussing the impact of race on their lives. And that's also a challenge that we must face uh, in, in, in approaching this way of, of telling client stories and, and being faithful to their stories as we tell them to you as judges. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. My name is Amy Serignano, and I'm a CJA panel attorney in the District of New Mexico. I'd like to thank the committee for the invitation to be here and to speak about CJA panel training in our district. I'm a former FBI forensic laboratory technician, a former FBI agent, and a former federal prosecutor. I was hired as an assistant United States attorney in the District of New Mexico, and I served in that role for approximately four years. For two years, I worked at the Department of Justice in the gang unit. I have been on the District of New Mexico CJA panel since 2009, and I have also served on our CJA panel committee. I'm also a former board member of the New Mexico Criminal Defense Lawyers Association. And I'm also a member of the National um, Criminal Defense Lawyers Association. 
Our 2015 CJA panel has approximately 101 members in Albuquerque and 35 members in Las Cruces. Members are appointed for a three-year term and can serve on uh, any of the following uh, panels, the general felony panel, the complex case panel, the appeals and habeas corpus panel, and the auxiliary or misdemeanor panel. Many of our um, panel members are Spanish speakers. Since 2009, on average, I have been appointed approximately eight to 10 cases a year. My testimony was requested to advise the committee about differences between training provided to government trial attorneys, assistant federal public defenders, and CJA panel attorneys. In preparation for this hearing, I spoke to our first assistant federal defender, CJA panel committee members, representatives from the New Mexico Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, and current assistant United States attorneys in our district. Comprehensive, ongoing, and readily available federal training is needed for all District of New Mexico CJA panel members. Our 2015 CJA plan requires four hours of mandatory CLE per calendar year in federal criminal practice at each CJA panel member's own expense. The plan outlines what kind of training meets those requirements, including local seminars offered by the Federal Public Defender, the New Mexico Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, the NACDL, or national programs available to CJA lawyers. This four-hour requirement can also be satisfied by providing or receiving mentoring. However, our CJA plan only allows mentoring after a request for mentoring of a CJA panel attorney by a member of the CJA panel committee. Failure to uh, comply with this four-hour training requirement is grounds for removal from the CJA panel. So assuming today that the playing field is level for all federal practitioners, training for CJA panel attorneys, assistant federal public defenders, and assistant United States attorneys is not equally available. The National Advocacy Center provides a two-week training program for all new assistant United States attorneys and advanced training for all federal prosecutors. The National Advocacy Center is staffed full-time with training professionals and recruits experienced AUSA and DOJ trial attorneys to teach. The District of New Mexico U.S. Attorney's Office also provides local training at least every six months, so the Albuquerque and the Las Cruces offices can meet and collaborate on our cases. The DOJ also provides a blue book publications on both substantives and procedural criminal law, which is readily available to all trial attorneys. During my six years as a federal prosecutor, I attended approximately eight classes at the NAC. Many District of New Mexico CJA panel attorneys obtain their federal training regionally through the Administrative Office of the Courts, Defender Services Office, or through the NACDL. The Defender Service Office does a great job providing regional in-person training, for example, the nuts and bolts of federal practice, winning strategies, the sentencing adv advocacy case Carlos just talked about, train the trainer that I just did in Santa Fe approximately two weeks ago, and the Defender Service Office has also provides a hotline for CJA panel attorneys. The NACDL provides regional training and an annual meeting on a variety of state and federal criminal law practice topics. NACDL also provides on-demand and self-study training programs and publications. Members have access to a substantial library and blog. However, the cost of NACDL regular membership is $319 a year for criminal defense attorneys in private practice. The fee for participation in CLE seminars is separate from the annual membership fee. Presently, our Federal Public Defender's Office provides weekly emails from the Defender Services Office on 9th and 10th Circuit case updates, 9th Circuit case of the week, information on certiorari grants, expert resources, and training opportunities from the Defender Services Office Training Division, one-on-one -on -one mentorship, and assistance is always available from our Federal Defender's <coughs> Office if a CJA panel member requests it. The Federal Defender's Office routinely provides samples of motions and other general federal practice assistance, 
and they often do moot courts for members um, arguing in front of the circuit or uh, need help with um, arguing motions and practice in district court. The Federal Defender's Office in the District of New Mexico is very ha uh, helpful, especially when CJA panel attorneys work with them on multiple defendant cases. However, in the District of New Mexico, CJA panel attorneys do not get access to the Federal Defender's National Listserv and the benefits of that Listserv network. My federal uh, law and practice questions are usually made on the NACDL Listserv, and my state practice questions are usually made on the NMCDLA Listservs. Many of the CJA practitioners in my district are not members of the NACDL or the NMCDLA. Our Federal Public Defender's Office works in cooperation with the NMCDLA to include some federal training in the local NMCDLA quarterly training programs throughout the state. The NMCDLA also provides an annual all-day summer CLE and award ceremony, a brief bank and library, and listserv. Occasionally, the NMCDLA will provide a morning session on a federal practice issue. The cost for NMCDLA membership is $50 a year for private attorneys practicing less than three years, $95 for private attorneys practicing three to seven years, and $155 for private attorneys practicing more than seven years. So in an ideal world, the District of New Mexico could adopt a training approach that other jurisdictions follow presently. A dedicated CJA webpage with substantial legal and practice resources announcements for monthly brown bag luncheons, fed talks, and an all-day spring or fall CLE training put on by the local federal public defender's office for CJA panel attorneys. The webpage could include formal guidance on practical issues such as service of subpoenas, commonly used forms in both English and Spanish, experts and expert transcripts uh, from Daubert hearings, information on client services, location and directions to the county jails, and a blog addressing the district court opinions by judge or topics. A federal brief bank for uh, motions in our district that have already been filed would also be very helpful. Development of a true second chair mentoring program for new federal practitioners or state practitioners who want to trans transition into federal court is fundamental to bring new talent into federal court. And yesterday you heard from Chief Judge Armijo who testified that she would like to uh, start a mentoring program and to uh, bring more uh, practitioners into federal court to raise the numbers of the CJA panel. Yesterday, Chief Judge Armijo also discussed our um, the, the district court's uh, uh, free one-day training um, for both federal and civil practitioners. Um, the topics include evidence, expert and discovery, trending topics in criminal, criminal law, preservation of issues for appellate review, and sentencing issues. There are real consequences when federal training is lacking in availability and substance. Needless trials, appeals, 2255, wasted precious CJA resources, and client misunderstandings and ineffective assistance of counsel claims are some concerns. Many CJA practitioners work in rural communities in New Mexico, and it is very difficult to leave New Mexico to attend regional training. It is estimated that each regional CLE credit costs approximately $75 per credit which requires time, airfare, and hotel expense, and meals. Moreover, the CJA attorney is not able to bill while attending training. Increased local CJA panning training can help resolve the following issues in New Mexico. The lack of availability of federal specific training, the lack of implementation of national training locally due to limited CJA funds for experts, mitigation videos, and specialists. Much of the training resources in the District of New Mexico is state-based through NMCDLA and not specific to federal practice. And the CJA panel attorneys are obligated by our District of New Mexico federal plan to self-pay for required CLE 
which often requires attendance at training outside of the district. Thank you very much. All right. We'll begin with questions. Dr. Rucker. Thank you, Judge Cardell. Uh, there's a number of things that come to mind here, but let me start out with very basic ones. One of the things that really troubled me is I heard that some of the courts don't have CJA plans, uh, and I'd like you to respond to that about should we be requiring CJA plans. And then I heard comments made from you, and we've heard uh, uh, from other people as well that um, I think Ms. Freeland said that she, you know, you're re uh, revising your plan right now, and you had pushback from having training as part of the plan, uh, or issues with mentoring programs. Uh, these things need to be absolutely critical and basic parts of that. And I'd like to hear from all of you about how we should address these kinds of issues. If I can um, speak to the issue of the lack of a model CJA plan in each district. Um, I think it's critical that we have a model CJA plan implemented into each district. State of Georgia um, is a prime example of what happens if you don't. The Northern District of Georgia has implemented the, a model CJA plan and their panel works very well. The Middle District of Georgia has not implemented a plan. And um, although now they're beginning to see, I think in part because they see the difference in advocacy between a federal defender's office and a CJA system that is clearly not working, that is clearly broken. Um, <clears throat> that they are now willing to sit down and help write a plan. I'm on the committee to assist the magistrates in writing that plan along with the panel rep um, who serves in my district, as well as local lawyers from each of the, where the courthouses are in each of the divisions, because we thought it was important to do that. We believe that there's a lot of talent in the Middle District of Georgia, but it's not being tapped to come into federal court because everyone has this idea that federal court is big and scary and um, bad things might happen there. <laughs> I, I don't know what they think. You know, to me, it's very similar to state court, except it's a little bit more formal. And um, we have a few more rules. Um, one of the things that we have discussed at least in, in developing our model CJA plan is that there will be required training. And for every person who um, is placed on the panel, they will do a two-day boot camp program on the nuts and bolts of federal criminal practice that our office will put on for them uh, each year. And, and that there will be terms so that people will rotate on and off. And it will become an honor to be on the panel, um, as it's an honor in the Northern District of Georgia to, to sit on the CJA panel. And then the third component that we have in Georgia, of course, is the Southern District of Georgia, where we there is no federal defender, where there is no um, model plan, where there um, have bankruptcy lawyers representing bank robbers who have no idea what is going on and, and what the rules are and how to implement the rules, how to even do the most basic things. I would like them to at least understand the guidelines, much less moving past, you know, what we need to do to push through the guidelines. And I think it's critical that there's a national CJA model plan that each district is required to adhere to, um, especially in those districts where there is no defender, and there are two districts left that do not have a defender. Um, the defender can do so much. We field calls, and the Northern District fields calls from CJA panel lawyers that are in the Southern District to try to assist them. Um, but that's a whole different ball game there, and we're not as familiar with the judges in that district as we are with our own. So they are at at a disadvantage and their clients are placed at an enormous, enormous disadvantage. Um, so I think that it needs to be written into 
the Criminal Justice Act. And um, I'll address your question specifically. I mean, this is, as far as I know, the revisions to our plan, it may be the first time that the plan was revived since we had a panel. So our plan was very old. Um, and I think that part of the initial, you know, the impetus to review the plan was maybe three or four years ago when indictment numbers were down and panel attorneys weren't getting enough cases to keep current with federal law. And I think this is something that happened around the country. And so we first set out on the revisions of the plan in an effort to have um, CJA membership not be lifetime membership. Um, and there would be removal procedures and reappointment procedures. And so that was kind of the goal when we went into it. And I think that it, it you know, that was still the goal, even though the indict indictment numbers went up, but there was concern um, among judges and others about the quality of representation. Um, and frankly, I think that some of the concern was more about the money um, that was being spent and that it wasn't so much that we were looking to remove lawyers that were not performing well in court, but lawyers that were identified as problems from a financial perspective. And so that also became a part of our revision process. Um, on the issue of whether I believe that every district should have a plan, I, I do personally believe that because it provides a structure um, for admitting members to the CJA panel, removing them. I mean, how do you even determine? I think when our, um, when our panel first started, the chief judge said, anybody and all, anybody who wants to come, we need people in federal court. Um, they were doing a service to the court to come and participate, but now we have the same people on the panel. Um, and I think just kind of connecting it back to training, if the, it's fine maybe if the same people are on the panel for 30 or 40 years, it, that might be fine if they're able to keep up with the dramatic changes in, in federal law over the years. Um, I've had instances where um, attorneys that were appointed under the CJA were not aware that um, the Fair Sentencing Act had been passed or were not aware of other I mean, things that clearly they were getting the information from the federal defender offices and otherwhere, but still, otherwise, but still were unaware, um, in part because there wasn't a, um, a robust training requirement to maintain membership on the panel. And so that is one of the things that having a plan in every district, you can have qualifications, eligibility to get on the panel, removal to maintain the panel, to include training. I understand that the model plan is under review right now and that those may be some, there may be some ways to strengthen the model plan so that then the districts around the country that are looking to the model plan to adopt their own local plans, that it will already be built in. In the current model plan, there is no training requirement. The eligibility requirements are sparse. There is no removal process. So I think a model plan could serve um, districts well in this area. And one final thing with respect to the pushback, I think, um, I think that it's just, you know, it's a cultural shift in a district where for 30 or 40 years there's been no requirement to have CJA lawyers now have a requirement to maintain their status on the panel, an educational requirement. Um, and as Amy pointed out, I mean, this is training that they have to get at their own expense. Um, and so there's also, there's a financial part to that as well. You know, we're increasing this requirement. Now, I understand as the federal defender in my district that by increasing the requirement, it also is going to mean that I'm going to have to provide more local training um, so that panel attorneys will not have to seek out uh, national programs in order to get the basic requirements to stay on the panel. And that's going to require an increased effort on my part as well. Just thank you. We're and thank you all for for being here. We're obviously looking at ways to uh, improve the CJA, and one of the things we're uh, we've been cautioned about is coming up with a one size fits all recommendation. Uh, Ms. Cirignano, uh gave us a list of of her concrete suggestions, and that's always 
very helpful. Um, what has your experience been with uh, communicating with the Defender Services Office? You've all said very positive things uh, about them in the training, and we're glad to hear that, and I'm sure they are. But what, do you have concrete suggestions for additional things that the Defender Services Office could do uh, or, or a change in the way they provide things? I very interested to read each of your statements and see that especially these three offices do something a little bit different. You had some excellent suggestions. Should there be sort of a model uh, plan for defender offices providing training, some, some basic fundamentals that nationwide uh, lawyers need? Do you have any thoughts on those topics? Um, I mean, I personally don't favor um, the one-size-fits-all approach. Um, in our offices and in our districts, and even, I mean, individuals are individuals, and they need different things. And so really being able to, to focus on, um, you know, what's relevant in your district. Um, we have different types of cases in our districts, and so there's some training that just isn't relevant to the lawyers in my district. Um, and although there's a lot that we can and should do locally, I think there's a real benefit both for CJA lawyers and for federal defender staff to go to national trainings and to interact with their counterparts from other areas. I mean, we just learn so much um, from what's happening in other districts, things that you might not think about in the culture of your district, um, and you learn it from somewhere else. And so if we kind of did away with some of those differences, I, I don't think that it would serve the practice um, in, in a positive way. Um, you know, in in my district, um, we do local trainings. Um, we have, I think our panel is only about 78 or 80 lawyers, which is large compared to other districts, but very small yet compared to others. And so there are things that we're able to do. Um, you know, we do brown bags when there's so many webinars available now on important topics that you know we'll order it for the office and anybody on the panel that wants to come and watch it and have a discussion afterwards will do that. Um, you really need to find what best fits both your staff and their strengths and weaknesses, their experience level, what they are most susceptible to in types of training, and do the same thing with the panel. And so um, you know many of the things that Amy mentioned, the specifics, um, there are many districts that are doing those things. In my district, for example, we don't have a brief bank, but any CJA lawyer at any time can call and write and they'll get a brief <laughs> you know, on the topic that they want. And it would honestly be too much work for my staff, given the size, to develop a brief bank when we can handle this issue on an ad hoc basis. And so I wouldn't want that to be a requirement. I do think, though, that we should have more training programs available through the Defender program. There are offerings through NACDL and other organizations that require membership, that cost a lot more money for the panel members, even for Defenders. When I want to send my staff to a NACDL program, if they're not members, you know, our cost is higher as well. And so I do think that that is a concrete thing that could be recommended, is an increase to the training branch staff so that they can provide more regional and national trainings for both defender staff and CJA attorneys because you've seen the, the plan. You offer something once a year. If you can't go, then you're, it's not available again until the next year, and it may be too late <laughs> the next year. So I think that is one concrete recommendation. Um, I, the biggest problem that I see is the ability, even when my two branch offices offer webinar trainings or going to, you know, letting them know what Defender Service Office is, the trainings that they are putting on, which are all excellent trainings, is the ability of my CJA lawyers to be able to get to those programs. It is a financial burden on them. So they're leaving a small town practice. Many of them are sole practitioners. They will be gone for two or three days from that sole practice. Um, they will be learning things that they have never even thought about before in many cases. Um, 
and they will be traveling to a destination on their own dime for the most part. There are some limited financial resources available through DSO, but they are limited. Um, so we have many lawyers who could benefit from those programs, but because of the costs and the time and the fact that they're in, they are sole practitioners in these largely rural areas, um, it creates a huge burden on them to be able to receive the training. Even with a webinar, we've discovered it's very difficult to get the panel lawyers in to watch a webinar because they want to see a live presentation where they can participate in that and talk to the others and learn from the others there. Um, I'm, I am not a big fan of the webinar. Um, I think it's probably because my attention span isn't long enough to sit there and, and listen to that for an hour to 90 minutes. Um, but also simply because you don't have that interactive feel that goes on when you are at a live seminar. And, and that's a shame because there are some excellent webinars. Now, I have many of those are embedded in, in, uh, in JNet or the, or the DWeb. So unless they come to our office to see it, they don't have access to see it. So they couldn't sit in the comfort of their own office and attend a webinar to begin with because they don't have access to get on the particular network that's showing that. Um, to have some of those on open access or open streaming networks would be much better for those in the rural areas for them to be able to see those things. It still doesn't take away that live element, which is so important, but at least it gives them a foothold. I can tell you that one of the most shocking things that I heard when I first came to the Middle District of Georgia because I started my federal uh, defender practice in the Eastern District of Washington under Judy Clark, who was, as most people know, we had training, office training every other week. We had brown bags for the CJA lawyers once a month. We put on a once a year program. So it was an office that was very highly directed towards training. Um, one of the things that I have found to be discouraging in my district is, and, and one of the things even that I've heard in my district when I first moved to the middle district as a senior litigator, I made a lateral move from Eastern Washington to the middle district was sitting in court one day and a CJA lawyer furiously flipping through his guideline book and then turned to me and said, I can't find 3553A in here and the factors that everybody keeps talking about. And, and I said, that's because it's in the statute, Mike, and you have to go to the statute because that's what they're now to concentrate on. You know, that, I mean, that is the type of representation that some of the clients in my district are receiving, you know. And then we sat down with him later and went through all that and explained that to him. Um, but that's a frightening thought, that someone doesn't recognize a statute versus a guideline. Um, and, and I think that that happens a great deal of time, and the judges don't know that it happens, you know, because... Many of them will just stick with, I'm happy with the guidelines. And I think as Mr. Williams pointed out, that should never be the goal, is to get a guideline sentence. Never. That is never the goal with any lawyer in my office, is to get a guideline sentence. In fact, we find that to be a failure. So, um, because it means that we didn't communicate properly to the judge how this person got in this space of time. Um, so, I, I don't I will tell you that um, financial resources are necessary for those lawyers to be able to attend and receive training and not go to NACDL or their local criminal defense lawyer associations. Those trainings are expensive. You know, at least DSO is able to offer the trainings um, for free. It's just the travel <coughs> becomes an issue for them. Um, I, I will be brief. I I was under the impression that that the uh, 
uh, CJA plan was required, already required by act in all districts. So I'm sort of surprised to hear that some don't have it. Of course, they don't have to adopt the model plan in total, but, but they're free to change and, and mix and match to match what the requirements in their district. Um, in the Southern District of Alabama, uh, uh, the, the, the court was really the impetus for our office. And it came about because many of the lawyers then practicing simply were not knowledgeable enough. Federal law had developed into a sort of a specialty, and they weren't familiar with, they weren't doing enough federal cases to really understand those, those requirements. And so in our district, uh, once we came into being, uh, we at first made it a voluntary thing that everybody could come and we would put on a, an event every year and they would get 12 hours of training every year in addition to whatever communication we, we gave. And we used to do drop brown bags. We don't do them anymore. But soon it became apparent that we needed to make it mandatory. And so it, they, are, they are required every year to attend our seminar once a year. And it's actually engendered a sort of a culture now, now we know that, that people, we, we have various committees where the CJ lawyers are part of that. We meet from time to time with the U.S. Attorney's Office to see if there are things we can resolve. Sometimes we go as a group, see the CJ representative uh, and, and myself to the court to see if we can resolve issues there. And because we're small, we only have, our panel is only about 35, between 35 and 40 cases, and it's kept small because we want to make sure they get uh, a fair number of cases uh, 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 to keep them interested in doing the things they need to do uh, uh, in those cases. If you don't get uh, a certain amount of cases, uh, you won't keep up. You simply won't keep up. It won't happen. You need to practice in order to do it. And for those that only get an occasional case here and there, you will always have a problem of them not fully knowing exactly which way to go uh, in a particular case. Uh, from time to time, uh, we may get, uh, when they had the Union County case, I think they arrested 85 people. We could only take one case. And we had to reach beyond the panel to get people who really normally wouldn't practice uh, federal law. So obviously, there were going to be problems there in, in big or large uh, uh, document-related cases. Uh, and we don't get many of those. It's one, one I got in late in the day. The case had been open for about three years. And I really couldn't imagine how the normal defendant could really afford to litigate those cases once I started seeing uh, the cost it would take to simply process the discovery, $2 million, $6 million, they don't have it. So when we came in, we were offering that service to act as a bank and to get the monies to try to get that done. But once, once I was out of the case, that's gone. Uh, 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 these are some of the, the things that, that, that come into play. I don't, I don't favor a one-size-fit-all fit as well. I think each, each district, both because of the type of cases that we get, the geographical issues that we face, uh, and many other things, just the culture in, 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 in the district uh, requires that, that they tailor it to their district uh, to be effective. I want to continue to talk about the national, local, regional training. And what's clear from the comments that you folks have made today and, and also Ms. Hunt's uh, comments about the difference between the jurisdictions when she worked in the Eastern District of Washington and Idaho and in the Northern, I'm sorry, in the Middle District of Georgia, is that there's a difference in quality and that's based on training. Some of it's based on training between the CJA attorneys and the um, federal public defender attorneys. And I, at least from what I hear from the folks on the panel, the national training seems to be adequate, if you will, even though there needs to be more of it and it needs to be um, probably better funded so more 
programs can be offered. The regional has been said to be pretty good training, but the local training uh, is what we need, at least for some rural districts uh, like New Mexico and uh, Middle District of Georgia and a number of the folks we heard from yesterday. And all the things that uh, Ms. Soriano was talking about in her statement today, those would all be great. They would ideal, as they say, blue sky. But the reality is, is that the federal defender offices and the community defender offices have limited funding. So the question I have for all of you is, knowing that we need more local training and knowing that some folks can't um, attend the regional trainings and can't attend the national trainings, even if they would like to, but it, does, it just doesn't work for their practice, and knowing that we need more locals, what would you think of the, the concept of funding that through the federal defender offices, having a person who is actually dedicated to be the CJA training attorney, and recognizing, obviously, that you know a lot of folks may think we can do that now, but the reality is, is that every attorney has to carry a certain caseload in order for that office to get funded, in order to literally pay the bills every year, or every month, if you will. And so that doesn't work just saying that we'll do it, because it is a lot more work to provide more trainings. But what do you think about that as a proposal? Can I start? Um, thank you. In preparation for um, this testimony, I spoke with uh, one of the, C um, the, the former CJ panel member well, who works now in the um, Federal Defender's Office in Kansas. And um, she was hired to uh, review all the vouchers, uh, implement the new e-voucher training system, and she is responsible for the uh, one-stop shop website and the training also. Um, that's where I got a lot of my ideas from after talking with her. Um, I think it's a great idea since there is limited funding in all the districts. I also don't believe that there's a one-stop shop um, because of geography, but if there was a point person within the Federal Defender's Office who could say, um, let's recruit some more experienced CJA members and have them put a morning session on um, Johnson or the Armed Career Criminal Act or um, sentencing issues, the minus two reduction um, for the drug cases uh, recently, um, since we're seeing a lot of those, or, or immigration law. Uh, many of us, I don't really do a lot of immigration cases because I don't speak Spanish, but, but um, a lot of the lawyers um, get assigned these cases, and they're not um, just a, an easy case. Uh, each, each individual, each immigration case needs to be handled um, uh, individually. So, so I think that with the point person within the Federal Defender's Office, that person can recruit those of us who have been on the panel for a while um, and are happy to do the training to um, train other members who might not have um, the years of experience in federal court. I'm open to the idea. I think uh, uh, that it, it, it may work. I, I certainly recognize that there is a, uh, that there's a, there's a difference in terms of perspective coming from the private lawyer to the federal defender. And we may not always anticipate their problems and challenges. Now, in my office, uh, I have an open door policy. They, they, our staff understands that we are there to serve them and, and, and to help them in whichever way we can. And so they know that they can come, they have an issue, we will talk about it. That's what we do right now. There may be other offices where that's not possible or feasible, but that's, that's, that's our, we consider that part of our mission. And, and part of our mission was to raise the sort of quality of, uh, of, of representation in our district, and we do that. When we give the, the, the yearly training, we don't just invite uh, CJA panel members, we invite all lawyers in our district to attend who may want to attend, it's free. Uh, so, so we try to, to address that by doing it that way. But there may be things that I don't see in that model uh, uh, that, that, that CJA lawyers may see as beneficial to them. So I would be open to it. I don't have a problem. Okay. 
Um, my first question is for uh, Ms. Um So you, you have a unique background, FBI agent, AUSA, and CJA lawyer. So um, sort of bottom line is the, sort of bottom line, <laughs> is, is the difference in resources and training that you get at the NAC, and the NAC trains FBI agents as, as well, um, that you got as, as an AUSA, are the resources and training you got through that program, uh, is there a huge gap between that and what you get as a CJA lawyer? Because I did, I heard you list some good, decent resources and training. So is it a really big gap? I would say it's a it's a fairly big gap, okay. yes, Judge. Um, the, the DOJ, they have mandatory training now um, for w both workplace issues and, and substantive criminal law and training. Uh, again, as an assistant United States attorney, you, you get your per diem paid, you get the travel, you stay at the NAC, um, the, the two-week uh, new prosecutor training, um, and uh, there's always resources available uh, for specific federal-based training. In New Mexico, as a CJ panel member, we, we do have the opportunity to attend the uh, Defender Services Office training, but uh, frequently, um, since we're uh, out west, the emails go out, and uh, by the time we get the emails, the classes are already full, <laughs> and um, you get put on a wait list, <coughs> and then you say, gosh, I sure do uh, wish I could get that sentencing class. I I'll be attending the sentencing class in San Diego in the spring, and I got lucky because I, I got the email and I stopped what I was doing and signed up for it right away. Would everyone, would everyone Everyone on the panel here agree that, and this is going to be sort of basic, that, that part of our recommendation should be more funding, a lot more funding from Defender Services. And yes. 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 Ever, yes. It's an, an affirmative yes from everyone. Okay. Uh, switching, completely switching topics, I have a question for Ms. Freeland, if, if I may. Part of our uh, mission is to uh, look into diversity and hiring amongst federal defender offices. And you and I have talked a little bit about that uh, before. Could you tell us, um, uh, I know you've done some work uh, in that area for the defender services. Um, I don't know, I don't have a clue how we quantify that. And uh, if you could help us on, on how we address that issue and what, what data, if there is any, we, we could be looking at. Well, I think the only the only data that's available for quantifying is going to be the number of people that currently exist on the panels or in the offices. And as you and I discussed, that's a self-report. Um, and it, it doesn't exist for the panels, only for the defender offices. Um, and so people have the option not to do that, not to report. Um, if they don't want to fill out, I think it's the AO 78 or whatever form that is. Right. Um, they, you know, they can, they can decide not to do that. But in terms of quantifying, I think the only way we can really do it is on the back end. And you and I discussed a little bit the difficulty of trying to quantify in terms of um, your recruitment efforts or even the interview process because you're not allowed to ask people about their protected class statuses during <laughs> during an interview. Um, and so that's difficult. Um, but I do think that what we've learned um, and are learning is that there are more effective ways of recruitment to get more diverse pools of individuals. Um, there are best practices that many offices already use and hopefully more will employ um, for the review of applications to ensure that our biases don't impact as extremely as they could our selection of candidates for interviews. And, um, you know, one of those is having multiple people review resumes. Um, it's often good to have somebody on your committee reviewing resumes that's familiar with the local um, culture, the city, the neighborhoods. Um, you know, I live in Pittsburgh, and um, for all intents and purposes, Pittsburgh is still a segregated city, and so you can often tell um, somebody's background from the address um, where they live. So, Could each of you just say if you're satisfied with the diversity 
uh, amongst both the three of you, your staff, and then and your panel? Can, can yeah, we're quite diverse in my office. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I mean, I'm not satisfied. Really. I'm not satisfied. How about, how about the panel? We're diverse. We're very diverse. But but um, but what we tend to see a lot of is we have 100 plus lawyers in Albuquerque and 35 CJA panel members in Las Cruces. And really, we're one big district, but our judges won't um, appoint people for the most part from one part of the state to another, um, most likely due to, uh, to travel. So you've got... Um, many more Spanish speakers, I think, um, in the Las Cruces area than in Albuquerque. And the only time that I would get appointed on a case down in the southern part of the state is if we get these uh, multiple defendant cases where they just run out of CJA panel members. And Judge, if I could just add one final piece um, is, you know, I think obviously it depends on where you are. In Pittsburgh, our panel is about 70 people. Um, we have fewer than 10 African-American attorneys on the panel, no Asians, no Latinos, and three women in a city like Pittsburgh. So we've got some serious recruitment challenges for our panel. Um, you know, I'm trying to be more aggressive in the office, but I think, again, another thing that impacts this, as I said in, in my opening remarks, is the ability of smaller offices to hire people with lesser experience because we're not going to get it if we continue to have the three plus years federal criminal experience. We've got to be able to have better supervision and training in our offices if we're going to diversify the program. But isn't that also um, effect or impacted by the fact that no matter what size the office, you have a certain number of cases that that person has to handle, again, in order to get funded. So the problem is, is that, you know, it's a great idea on kind of changing the focus and saying, um, let's not just focus on people who are very experienced, but let's open that up to a larger group so we can try and get and make sure that our offices are more diverse. But we are pushed up against, as the federal defender, you're pushed up against the reality of having to make certain numbers in order to pay the bills. So how did There's no question cool? about that. And I mean, it's a, it, it's a huge sacrifice on behalf of the other people in the office when you bring in somebody who doesn't have the experience and attach them to another lawyer for maybe a year, um, working only as a second chair or as you know, an assistant um, assistant. Um, but you know, one thing that offices can do is they can offer fellowship positions. And perhaps there's a way for there to be um, some temporary fellowship training positions and offices that aren't included within our work measurement study total because that's I mean it's something that we have to do but the constraints that you identify are real and so if there's really a commitment to getting this done it's going to have to be on a different track. No I totally agree. Have you had any conversations with anyone about that concept? I know the Eastern District of Washington in Idaho has um, a fellowship program and in fact uh, my office hired an individual from that program. Uh, maybe, uh, Ms. Hunt, you could speak to that issue. Um, I would like to be able to hire a fellowship lawyer because I would, I, in an ideal world, you know, to take a young lawyer and shape them in the culture that we are building um, gives them a step up into another office or to stay with mine and stay on track. I currently have a paralegal investigator who we are basically grooming for the next attorney position. I'm an Asian woman uh, simply to get the diversity and because we wanted her to see things from all aspects that seemed the best way to do that um, at the current where we were in terms of with our numbers was to p place her in a position where she would see everything sort of from the bottom up, which a fellowship lawyer a lot of times gets to do. Um, and I know in the Eastern District of Washington, they handled primarily the 13th, the illegal reentry cases. Um, although they did, second, I would second chair them or they would second chair me on some of the, you know, trials that I had. Um, 
but it's certainly something that we need to look at in terms of more flexibility in our hiring practices to be able to say, I want a fellowship lawyer. I don't need another research and writing assistant. I need a fellowship lawyer um, to give them a step into a career in federal criminal law. Or at least if they leave my office and they go out in the real world and they begin to take CJA law panel appointments, then they have a firm base of what that feels like to practice in a defender office where things are, are done right. In terms of the diversity, and I want to go back to this, um, it's very difficult in my district to find diverse employees. Um, and, and the reason that I say that is because, again, we are a very rural district, and if you tell someone, hey, come live in Macon, Georgia, most people go, where is that? <laughs> um, and if you say it's in the heart of Georgia, then the next question is, why would I want to do that? <laughs> and the answer to that is because it's 84 miles to Atlanta, and you can go to Atlanta and then come back in the same day. But it's very... <laughs> It's very difficult to attract in some of these rural districts, you know, diverse applicants. And, of course, I think the defenders have all been having this discussion about how do we fix this? How do we attract diverse applicants to places where people don't want to go live, you know, in an ideal world? Um, and then the retention of those diverse applicants becomes even more difficult uh, after they, you know, served a battle term in Macon, Georgia, or in Columbus, Georgia. Actually, Columbus is a little bit better because at least there's an Air Force, an uh, Army base there, Fort Benning. Um, but it, it is very difficult to do that. And although I think we share names of applicants, you know, that we have coming in when we've had this big sort of hiring going on right now, um, it's still difficult if someone gets an offer, you know, between three cities and, and one of them is Macon. They're more inclined to look at the other cities we found than Macon. We can get them to Macon and kind of brainwash them a little bit, which we try to do. Sometimes that works. But it is difficult, especially Spanish speakers, especially Latinos. And I've had some conversations and, you know, I think one of the one of the reasons why the time might be right for this is also what's going on in law schools, because um, so many law schools now are offering these fellowships because their students can't get jobs. And so there may be a way for us to do this even at a slightly reduced cost um, because the law schools are paying the fellows to come and be in your office. and. Um, some of them are a year, some of them are two years, but it, and so I, but it, the commitment has to be there to doing the training, both in-house and outside, as Tina said, so that, you know, if we have somebody there for a two-year fellowship, even if my office doesn't have the ability um, under our staffing formula to hire them, there's plenty of other offices in the country that will. Um, and we need to do better at really advertising our program so that people know this is a great job. Um, you know, this is a quality of living, a, good, a living wage, great work, um, very fulfilling. Um, and you can do it anywhere in the country if you get the skills and want to do it. And so I think we need to, we need to be out in law schools selling our, selling our program, selling the work, Doing, putting the time that's needed into recruitment and maybe being able to take advantage of, you know, this timing with the law schools with these fellowships being available. I think the Eastern District of Washington actually um, turned their R&W positions or a couple of their R&W positions into this fellowship category, which they did under Judy Clark because it's very difficult for anyone to say no to Judy. So I think she was able to get that done when she was in the Eastern District of Washington working with DSO. Sir, you have I, a, um, go ahead, I was, I was going to say, I, I believe Judge Fisher sure, has go a ahead. question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to, I guess, broaden it a little bit, and it's, it's so obvious that people need training, especially hearing some of the particular stories, but 
Are there any meaningful uh, performance standards that you use or you think can be used? Uh, it's obvious when someone doesn't know where 3553A is that that person is not performing uh, as, as we would like. But as a, as a whole in dealing maybe even within your offices, but maybe more importantly because they have less immediate supervision, the panel lawyers, do you have suggestions as to what we can do on that topic? Well, there are performance standards that the federal defenders now have, uh, and uh, I don't know how widely distributed it is, but there are performance standards in place already, and that was developed primarily for federal defenders. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question with respect to CJA lawyers, but th there are performance standards. And, and what, ki what kind of standards are you talking about? For any sort of, anything that affects what we do as, as, as federal lawyers, uh, uh, there are standards developed uh, primarily in the AO's office. Uh, they were developed by PUMWAG. I'm a member of PUMWAG. Performance management, and I can't remember what the rest of the acronym means. I, I just say PUMWAG at this point. Uh, but but the standards were developed over a number of years, and it's very detailed. Uh, to, it goes to just about any aspect of the job. It does not attempt to say that this is this is the only way you can do the work, uh, but it tries to set some standards uh, so that that people can be aware of what the job requires. Our CGA plan doesn't have actual performance standards in it. It's more a higher, uh, becoming a member of the panel and then maintaining that membership. And then if difficulties arise, uh, the process to either appeal or, or um, uh, have some mentoring if there, if there are some, some problems with, with uh, uh, attorney's representation. I guess there's a part of the question is who's minding the store? Is it common in your districts for, say, one CJA lawyer to say, I just co counseled with this other CJA lawyer and really he doesn't, he or she shouldn't be doing this kind of work at all? How do you deal with that? I mean, I've gotten, yeah. oh, you go ahead, Carlos. In my district, we have a CJA committee. And, and in the CJA committee, it's the chief judge, uh, one of the magistrates, myself and the CJA panel representative on that. And, and we are the ones who uh, either feel complaints or, or decide, essentially, who stays on the panel and who goes. And that's the way it's done in my district. That's the way it's done in my district as well. And, and I think that um, now that we've got Chief Judge Armijo and one of the federal magistrates on our CJA committee, uh, I believe that um, many of the other judges provide input to them to bring to the CJA uh, panel committee uh, membership meetings and in every, um, uh, our, our applications are due in July and they normally meet in September and uh, the um, lawyers are reviewed by the committee. Um, ones that are up for reappointment uh, every three years. And, uh, and then if there's a problem, like for example, we had a lawyer that um, uh, had uh, specific problems with a judge and then was later indicted, uh, he was removed off the panel. So uh, the, <coughs> our committee generally watches the quality of representation in our district. I have to say in my district, you do have to be breathing. And that's even though you're qualified apparently to be on the panel if you're not breathing. Um, but where the performance standards come in for the CJA lawyers is really from the judges who will tell the magistrate, don't send this person back into my courtroom. Um, whereas many times those lawyers that the judges are saying that about um, are probably savable, salvageable if they had the training, if they had the know-how, if they had the wherewithal to ask for that. Instead, in a sort of secret meeting between the judges and the magistrate, they just magically don't get cases anymore, which doesn't improve the performance standards of anyone because there's no published standards 
performance standards for the CJA lawyers. How do you know what you're supposed to meet if nobody tells you what it is? Um, Ms. Hunt, I hate to interrupt, but um, I have a question. I mean, doesn't, uh, I have a bigger concern about that comment, which is um, if you have a judge who doesn't like certain advocacy or, you know, is upset with that lawyer, doesn't that put a, a lawyer in the position of, well, you're not practicing in my court anymore because you made a stupid motion or, you know, I, I just don't, why are we wasting my time kind of thing? Um, isn't that a real danger if, if that's the standard we're using? I think that's very dangerous. You know, I, I will say the biggest complaint that has been voiced to me by the bench is that they don't go see their clients until maybe the day before a hearing the day before a plea. And that really is a problem. How are you supposed to know what the defenses are? You know, that means you're taking the first plea agreement put on the table, which is never a great plea agreement. Not that any of them are terrific, but, you know, that certainly the first one you get, which just says waive everything and plea to the indictment, um, is, is not doable. And they're not having contact with their clients. And that's the biggest complaint I hear coming from the bench. You know, every time I send out an email saying, what do you want me to train the panel on? It's client relationships, you know. So, and I have seen judges get upset at what they believe are frivolous motions, but I have not seen, if the lawyer is a good advocate, removal of those lawyers from the panel. And if, and if I could just add, I want to take a slightly different perspective. I mean, we have had in our district, I mean, usually the call comes to me, don't send that lawyer. I mean, and we, through the um, CJA plan, hope to deal with that so it doesn't fall on me. It will fall to the committee devised under the plan um, because I, you know, get calls from attorneys constantly, well, why haven't I gotten any appointments? And I can't say, well, Judge so-and-so told me not to. Um, and so we've resolved that. But I think that as defenders, we also, um, you know, have to spend a substantial amount of time educating the bench about what is required in a federal criminal case. Um, oftentimes, the complaints that come from the bench are because there's not an understanding of what needs to happen in a case. I think many of our judges can spot poor performance. You know, they know when somebody comes into their courtroom and they're not prepared, or when they've given a directive, there will be no further continuances, and the, the attorney keeps coming forward with excuses. Um, in my um, district, we just the board of ju judges just approved district-specific CJA guidelines, which are really financial guidelines. And, you know, one of the issues is that all of our detained clients, or I'd say 90% are now detained in Ohio, in Youngstown, Ohio, which is about an hour and some minutes from Pittsburgh. Well, these guidelines require the attorneys to get court approval before traveling out of state. And although I advocated for an exception to visit clients at any OCC, that was rejected. Um, one of the guidelines is to have attorneys have to get permission from the court if they are one of the 12 people that hire an investigator and they want to take that investigator with them to the jail to interview the client. And so there are some procedures that are in place that make it very difficult. Um, I shouldn't say very difficult. That's really overstating it. But it's more cumbersome for the panel attorneys to do what the performance standards require, what any one of us would be able to do in our offices without a blink of the eye, send an investigator out to meet with a client and an attorney. If we want to send two attorneys and the investigator, we could do that. And there are good reasons to send an investigator out to visit a client with an attorney. But sometimes we have to take the time to really help the judges bring them along so that they understand what the performance standards require, the fact that we would be able to comply with them, and it's not easy to comply with them even for the best of us, um, and then translate that into the CJA practice where money is on the line in a different way. Although money's on the line with our offices and our budgets, it's very different when the individual judge in a case is approving the vouchers, approving the experts, approving the investigators. There's a different investment then in whether that attorney should undertake a procedure that we would all agree 
is a best practice and required under the performance standards. And maybe one of the things that we ought to be doing is sharing those performance standards with our judges so that our judges not only know by comparing what they see in the courtroom, but what is really the best practices for our profession so that they have a better idea when people come to them with requests or when they see something in the courtroom, whether it is or is not complying with the performance standards that have been adopted. I'd like to echo that wholeheartedly. Um, I, I do think that at times um, there are lawyers in my district that um, would like to hire a mitigation specialist at sentencing or to, like I said earlier, bring that regional training that we get into the courtroom in New Mexico, but um, we file the motion, the CJA ex parte motion, and uh, sometimes it gets um, denied, uh, and sometimes it gets denied with a, a, a hearing or a telephone conversation about why a judge wouldn't necessarily want to have these experts at sentencing. That's happened to me uh, a couple of times. But, but I also think that if we did maybe adopt the federal de defender's performance standards and have a baseline um, best practices for our panel members, the quality of representation would definitely go up. I was shocked yesterday to hear from our federal defender that he sometimes gets calls from the assistant United States attorneys about our panel members not uh, returning phone calls. That's shocking to me because I don't really see that quality of representation uh, among my colleagues. But um, I, I also think that um, um, th there are younger lawyers who are great lawyers in state court that with a little bit of um, mentoring um, on the misdemeanor panel could get in there and um, start second chairing cases and start doing motions to suppress um, with the senior lawyers to, to, to actually bring in members who really want to be there because being on the CJA panel in the District of New Mexico is an honor and I think that most lawyers feel that way. I have a follow-up question to your um, issue of uh, mitigation experts or any kind of expert. Um, for the um, FPDs or the, 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 the training that you do, do you train on the use of experts? And then um, I would like to hear maybe, or we would like to hear some, some stories about whether the judges, once they go back to use those experts and file those motions, are the judges approving them or are they getting a lot of pushback? And then for you, Ms. Arignano, um, have you received that kind of training? And um, I think you're saying that you have, and then when you try to use those experts, you're told, well, you know, what, what are you trying to do? So um, do, you, do you give the training and then what feedback do you get about them trying to use the experts? Well, first of all, in, at least in my district, I find that many of them don't realize that there is a set amount that you can use without first getting approval from the court. So it's the CJA lawyers who, you know, we need to spend more time explaining to them, there's this amount of money that you can have that the judge cannot say no to. Now, it's never enough money. And especially if you need an investigator or a mitigation specialist or whatever. Um, but those, that money is available to you. The defenders, of course, it's built into our budgets. We don't have to ask permission to say, I want to hire a mitigation specialist. I need a psychiatric assessment done on my client um, for, you know, uh, PTSD. I don't have to ask the court for that money because it's built into our budgets. Um, and while it's somewhat built into the CJA plan, it's certainly not enough money to do that. The average in my district psychological assessment cost around $3,000, which is well above what the CJA lawyers are authorized to spend before getting further authorization. And that's just the average. So, and of course, uh, many times um, when I was a CJA lawyer, because I was one for 11 years before I joined the Defender system, um, they would say, well, we'll just send them to Butner or, or Springfield or, you know, and, and I'm thinking, I really want to know if there's a problem before I send them off for 45 days 
and then an additional 45 days, and then an additional 45 days for them to get the report. It seems to me that that's a better use of resources and cheaper to give me $3,000 to do it than to send them to BOP for 90 days. But are, so are the CJA attorneys using or trying to use experts and um, or are they not and do they get it? Some are, the better ones will, and the better ones will push and make a good case in their ex parte motions as to why they need the funds for the experts. Um, the other ones, not so much, especially in the, when they come from the smaller towns, not as much. And that's the, my experience as well. I mean, it's limited. I mean, and those, those numbers are available just as the use of investigators among mm -hmm. the CJA panel broken down. Um, but I do, I mean, I don't, I don't want to overstate it, but I do think that they're, they're there's this budget cloud that hangs over, and it does make people less likely to ask for the money, um, even those that are inclined to do so. Um, we do provide local training on the use of experts. Um, we've had judges come and speak at our training programs, and they want to see experts. I mean, if we're going to come into sentencing asking for something based on a diagnosis, they want, you know, they want to see from the hear from the experts. And so we try and encourage the panel lawyers, both by using the judges and our own experience, um, to encourage them to to take the leap and, and use the experts. But the numbers are relatively low. Are they coming to the, the seminars that you're putting on? Yes. The panel lawyers? Do, do you do they do. Like I said, mine is mandatory, so they're, they're definitely there every year. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, there's, I mean, there's there's so much information out there. I mean, it's kind of, it, you know, it's difficult for us. I mean, we get people to our training programs. I, you know, the website is another idea. We send out emails, but, the, you know, you guys get, you know, the emails that you get all day long, all day long. I mean, we have to limit what we can communicate to the panel lawyers because there's a point at which it's too much and they just hear nothing. Um, and, and our programs, our yearly programs, are a good place um, to do that kind of training. And it is available in the more national and regional training programs that are offered through the training branch, dealing with clients with mental illness. I have um, in my office a non-capital mitigation investigator um, and another investigator, to the both of them that have masters in social work. It's a tremendous use of resources in helping identify um, you know, what issues might be alive in a case. And it's true that there is $800, but we had an experience recently in our district where even to know what expert services you need, you might need to talk to an expert. Um, and this case invo involved um, uh, child pornography and a forensic examination. And the panel attorney reached out to um, a company that could help to get information from the putative expert to provide to the judge in support of the request. And in return, he was excoriated for having spoken to an expert in advance of getting permission to engage an expert. And so when you have these kinds of experiences, it just, um, you know, it makes the panel attorneys more hesitant to do what they know, many of them know needs to be done. But the difficulties that they experience when they try to do it is, um, I think, a detriment to, to the quality of the representation that people are getting in our district. And I, and I think it's, it's, it's also a matter of shifting cultures. Uh, the more we do it and the more they see the results that we get in our small district, we, I find that there's more of an interest in, in hiring, and many can hire in my district to get an evaluation below the cap. The question is above the cap, and then that's a that's a whole different ball of wax. But 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 I can see in my district where where the culture is beginning to shift to where more and more lawyers are doing it. And I need to check the numbers to make sure that's the case. But I believe that's happening. I don't know if there are any experts in my district that are actually take a below the cap rate. And and what Tina said about um, uh, getting an, a local evaluation, my budgets generally run twenty eight hundred or three thousand dollars just to do a local evaluation mm -hmm. prior to. Um, really determining if there's a, an, an issue to put somebody uh, in Seriously. the BOP 
custody. I've had a little bit of pushback on that. I, I use experts frequently. I always use an investigator. We have those resources at the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Federal Defender has those resources right away. I, I'll sometimes call up the Federal Defender and say, hey, um, we get a cap of, um, I think it's $500 for an investigator um, before we submit a budget for um, additional fees. And so I can call and say, hey, you guys are on the same case. Um, can you send your guy out until I get my order back from um, my judge on my CJ budget and the Federal Defender's Office is always very helpful with that. Um, in terms of experts, our New Mexico Criminal Defense Lawyers Association is having an all-day uh, expert training coming up um, in December. Um, uh, we, we do have uh, expert training. Um, I have gotten some resources on experts. Uh, I went out of state to do a, a death penalty training uh, in California to get some uh, uh, death penalty experience. But but I just think that this budget cloud that Lisa talked about, um, if, a, if a federal judge um, who's looking at our ex parte motions <coughs> and our budget request deems that uh, he or she doesn't need an expert, uh, mostly at sentencing, then um, usually it's um, uh, discouraged. Is and voucher cutting sort of, is voucher cutting uh, making the cloud bigger? Um, Both experts and, and attorneys out there? So from my experience and the experience of my colleagues that I spoke to, most of us submit budgets at the beginning of the case, because most of the cases that I handle exceed the $9,700 cap. So we put a budget in the beginning of the case to kind of give the court uh, an idea of where we're going to head with this. And so um, what discourages a lot of our panel members, I know, is that once a budget has been put in and authorized by the judge hearing the case, at the end of the case, or even uh, if there's interim billing allowed in the case, the budgets are cut, and or the, excuse me, the vouchers are cut um, once submitted. And so I understand, though, now from this new e-voucher system, that there will be a mechanism where we the, we could track what was submitted and what was actually um, uh, awarded to a panel member. Cutting, the cutting will now just occur through the computer. <laughs> well. <laughs> Well, there is a way. Uh, a question was asked yesterday on how we get the uh, metrics um, to understand um, how budgets were cut. Um, uh, at least in my district, um, uh, we, we would submit the voucher to our financial services office. You did, you did a lot of outreach, I think, to your panel members, and, and we really appreciate that. What was the sense, what was their sense and your sense as to voucher cutting? I think it happens more often than within the last few years than it did before. Does everyone else agree? Yes. That is our, that is our experience. And I think, you know, one of the things um, that maybe you all recognize is that um, particularly in our district now that we're going to have a removal and reappointment process as part of the CJA is the attorneys want to be viewed favorably yes. by the judiciary. Um, if they think that the, uh, that the judge doesn't want an expert, they're not going to put it on. If they think that something's going to be denied or that they're going to be seen as frivolous, they're not going to put it on because there's this idea that maybe the cases that they're getting assigned is somehow related to their practice when, in effect, it's a rotation. I mean, they're going to get the cases, <laughs> as long as they're on the panel, they're going to get the cases in rotation just like everybody else, but it's hard to break that perception. Um, how do you train a lawyer not to care what the judge thinks about you? Um, you know, that, that that's not training worth having. So um, I think that also is part of the problem, but um, the voucher cutting is more frequent. I get reports um, of all the vouchers that are paid in our district. Um, I think it's probably on a biweekly or monthly basis, and so I'm able to see um, the attorneys whose vouchers are being cut, the judges that are doing the cutting, the, the amount, and how often. And I do think that it is something that's more frequent now than it was um, pre-sequestration, for example. Are they giving reasons? Are the judges giving reasons? Well, on the sheet that I see, no. Um, we have had a couple um, of cases where um, attorneys have appealed. I mean, 
I say appealed, even though there's no appeal, they have asked the judge for reconsideration. Um, and there have been a couple of judges that have written opinions about why um, the vouchers were cut. And I thought, and I, and many of those, I think, have been under seal. And I know that there was one recently where the CJA panel attorney requested that the judge put the opinion under seal because he was concerned about his reputation among his colleagues and um, with the bench. And I'll tell you that one of, um, this is a little bit off topic, but I think it is relevant to the issues that you're considering is that there have been a couple of instances in our district where the CJA lawyers have left their file with the judge for review in determining whether their voucher was appropriate. And not only is that a problem from the perspective of the CJA lawyer, but for a judge to not hand the file back and say, you know, this, I can't, I can't have this. And then in the opinions has been information written that was taken from the file um, as the judge explains why various things were not required for the representation in that case and why the voucher would not be paid for those things. And do any of you, have you heard the explanations uh, or seen them in writing? And do you, do you agree, yes, this was too much, or the judge you know, does, doesn't know how much it costs to do a sentencing position, for example? We have not had voucher cutting in my district that I'm aware of. Judge, I think that there's a common thread or a common thought in New Mexico that if you do that, you might not... You're, you're um, biting the hand that feeds you, so to speak, right? And yesterday, um, Chief Judge Armijo um, said a few times that um, that CJA cases are bread and butter for a lot of uh, panel members. And um, personally, I think that's a good thing. I, I think that um, we can have very qualified CJA panel members who focus specifically on federal criminal defense. Federal defenders do that every day. I don't know, um, or I don't understand why that would be deemed as a negative when a CJA panel member wants to become an expert in federal criminal cases or federal court, either it be by CJA appointments or by privately retained cases. I think many of us on the panel do both. Um, I, I think that in terms of a solution for this voucher cutting problem, I would propose that um, there be specific training on how to write a budget. Because when I came on the panel, I'd asked the senior lawyers, how do you do a budget? Well, how, how do you figure out that you're going to need an investigator to work three hours a week for the next six months on this case and kind of map it out at the very beginning of the case when most times you don't even have all the discovery, right? And so I think that uh, that solution would be very helpful. Ask the judges what they would like to see in their budget. Obviously, you're not going to get a consensus on that um, from the members of the bench, but but that would be very helpful um, to have that. And um, uh, and then and then at that point, have an opportunity to talk with the judge uh, uh, when the interim bill is filed or at the end of the case as to why. Um, our our um, our funds were cut. Um, we only have one judge right now, as far as I know, that will call and say, "Well, we're going to cut your voucher by X amount. Do you want it processed?" And most of us say yes because the 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 wait time sometimes it could take six weeks or six months to get a voucher um, processed in my district. You know, an another solution that I thought I'd share with the panel is in the District of Kansas, um, they have just adopted a standing order for all CJA cases allowing for interim billing. And, and the parameters are um, you can file interim billing if the case exceeds $4,000 or four months. I think that would be a great idea because uh, many of the CJA lawyers um, uh, find it very difficult, especially if they're accepting a lot of CJA appointments, to wait to the very end of the case to bill. And I usually have found that the judges 
don't like to wait to the end of the of the case to bill, and the vouchers are cut um, at that point because they think, oh gosh, this bill is just mm -hmm. tremendous. So I would support the interim billing. I think both for communication with the court on on um, on how much money is actually being spent, and the lawyer will have a cash flow um, into his or her solo practice. Well, we're trying to figure out exactly what the nature of this issue is. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we could all agree that sometimes lawyers bill for things that are not reasonable and sometimes judges cut things that shouldn't have been cut. But where we are within that spectrum and whether it's district by district or judge by judge, um, if I cut a voucher, it's obviously because, you know, I I'm going to tell you that it's because what was done wasn't reasonable. If the lawyer has a voucher cut, most of the time, the lawyer is going to say, everything I did was reasonable. I put in uh, all of that time and I should have been paid every dime. So I, I don't know what mechanism we can use to try to figure out how big the problem really is and then how do we address that. So if you have any thoughts on... I mean, I do judge. I think, um, you know... Before you said that, I'm thinking of the instances where I know specifically what the reasons for the voucher cuts were, and I can't say that there was one that I agreed with, and, um, particularly the cases that have been written about. And I think that um, things could have been handled better. Um, you know, the CJA guidelines are an opportunity um, for lawyers to get the money that they need on the cases if they do it correctly. And so we do provide training on how to use the guidelines, what's compensable, what's not compensable. Um, but, but as we're focusing on some of the disparities between federal defender offices and CJA, um, I think I bring that perspective when I'm looking at the, at the reasons that are given for cutting the vouchers, because I know that my attorneys would do that and that I would approve them doing that. And so I think that if you could involve attorneys in the voucher review process so that it's not just the judge, um, you know, we have wonderful judges on the federal bench, but the one thing that most of them aren't and never have been is criminal defense lawyers. They've never been public defenders. What we do is very different than what most of you did in your practices before coming to the bench. And that doesn't make mean that your experience is irrelevant to the question, but we know from our own experience in managing federal defender offices where we have budgets that we have to stay within, what are and are not reasonable expenses. I had a judge when I, um, I often, I call them road shows, go on the road, which is really just across the street to meet with all of the judges to talk about issues, and the budget has been a big one. And um, one of the judges who is very familiar, he's been a senior judge, has been around for quite a while, is familiar with Defender Services, um, had a trial where one of the CJA lawyers had obtained an acquittal. And he told me that he cut the voucher in that case, um, because in the days leading up to the trial, the attorney had an investigator out at the prison and they were out there hanging out with the defendant and that he, the, the, the Sixth Amendment didn't require hand-holding. And so I had to question him and say, you know, do you think that maybe some of the conversations that were happening during those three, four days before the trial between the lawyer, the client, and the investigator might have actually had an impact on the result? It didn't matter to him. He thought the attorney did a great job, the jury acquitted, but he wasn't going to pay because he personally believed that that was not reasonable. That's a problem. I don't know whether you all know, but we've talked about this before. Judges get absolutely no training on <laughs> reviewing vouchers. Would you recommend that perhaps yes. some yeah. training be... Mm -hmm. I think a solution also is is that point person within maybe the federal defender's office, the case budgeting person, whatever the the, the title could be within the federal yeah. defender's office. And I know that you know the federal defender's office is completely overworked, and that's not something that that our federal defender wants to be doing is looking at all of of our budgets. But maybe somebody within the office to say, hey, this is great you know, or I have a question about this, and then send it up to the judges. I, I think that CJ panel lawyers are at a disadvantage in the sense that that um, the judge that will be trying our case gets to preview mm -hmm. our um, defense strategy and, um, and uh, our requests 
um, for our defense um, uh, prior to the case actually going to say suppression or 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 trial. And so um, maybe there should be somebody within each district to look at those requests, the requests for the budget and the vouchers independent from the court and have the court be the ultimate ultimate um, decision maker on on um, uh, say an ex parte motion or or a, or a payment of a voucher. And I think that that would work fine in a district where the um, defender manages the panel, but where the defender does not manage the panel, which is the case in my district, um, I don't know how that would work. So, and, and as another thing as to voucher cutting, we see very little voucher cutting in the Middle District of Georgia. And I suspect that's because the lawyers don't put in enough hours that it needs to be cut, number one. Number two, what I have seen, where I have seen cutting, is where a judge will say, well, this was a frivolous motion. I'm not going to pay you for any of this. And yet, in talking with both, you know, with me, with other experienced CJA lawyers, this lawyer was also an experienced CJA lawyer and had previously been in the defender's office, um, he raised a conflict of interest between the judge um, overseeing the case, where at the beginning it was a uh, prisoner cruelty case where the guards were charged with violating civil rights of some prisoners at a prison. And the judge, right off the bat at the very beginning, um, said, well, I've represented this prison on many occasions. And, you know, we kind of saw that as a conflict of interest, quite frankly. Um, so, you know, that issue was raised. He was very perturbed that it would be, that he would be called unethical by any standard and cut that whole portion of the voucher, you know, which is a legitimate, was to me a legitimate motion to make for the record. I'm somewhat confused by by this conversation only because everything that's been said and then uh, Ms. Sergiano you just said but the judge should ultimately be the person to decide. That it should go through all these levels of people who have experience in criminal criminal defense to try and make determinations as to whether it's reasonable but then the judge should ultimately be the person to decide. The person who has probably very little, if any, experience in criminal defense. Do all of you agree that it should be the judge to no, decide? No, I don't think it should, it should be the be judge. A different, a different decider? I think it should be a different decider. I, I agree with what uh, Mr. McHugh said yesterday, and I think he, he, he went with that it should be an independent person apart from the judge. In terms of approving, say, experts, that would immediately deal, to some extent, at least with the parity issue. We get our expert without asking the judge for it. Uh, the, the panel should be able to get an expert without doing that as well. But somebody that who's experienced in, in looking at these things could do that and get that done. I'm not so familiar with the problems with voucher cutting. Like I said, I, I don't have much experience with that in my district. I, I, and, and I, but I do believe that that's also a function and reflected in, the, in when people don't ask for investigators and we had a serious problems with, with that in the past. So, so that may also reflect that they are deciding the cases based on what the guidelines suggest or how the guidelines would, 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 would suggest the case should be resolved without actually doing the work. Uh, and, and so, anyway. Um, I guess I probably should clarify what, what I was thinking. Um, I, personally, I don't think that the, the judge that's hearing the case, if, 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 um, if, if I would make a, make a recommendation, it would be maybe a, 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 a different judge or say an executive director uh, this uh, case budgeting person within the, di the district um, be the final um, approval uh, of these vouchers and, and the budgets. But at least in my district, it's always been that way that the court was the final um, 
decision maker on the budgets and um, and and the vouchers. And so um, perhaps my statement is knowing in practice and not theoretically that that our bench will probably not want to give up that um, function or that authority, but um, at a minimum have a judge independent of the case um, looking at that or somebody from the Federal Defender's Office or this case budgeting person. That would be the, um, the best recommendation or the best situation. Why do, you, why do you think your judges don't want to give up that authority? <laughs> if speaking for myself, there's three other judges on the <laughs> panel here. I would be delighted not to have to review vouchers. Um, I just think that that's what's always been done, and I think that it would require a change in the culture to um, to move forward like that. And I'm not saying that um, it's an impossibility. I just think that uh, that's just the way things have been done in my district. But that's the way things have been done everywhere. So the question really is before us, is that the right way for things to be done or you folks being the experienced people, you think it's a different way that things should be done? A different way. I, I would agree with a different way would probably be the, the better way. And I like, um, you know, the, we don't have it in our district, but districts that have committees, um, because there are conflicts all around. Having the federal defender do it isn't necessarily better when they might represent a co-defendant in the case. And so that wouldn't be available. So to the extent that there's an opportunity to have um, committees that deal with uh, the vouchers and requests, I think that would be much better than the system that we have right now. But I think I, I mean, it's, you know, we're living in the world where we live, where the options are limited. Um, and I do think, uh, Judge Goldberg, that some of the judges in my district might not want to get, but this is, you know, I'm projecting onto them what they might think or want or believe, but the vigor that they've shown in exercising their reasonableness review tells me that it's something that um, they, they take quite seriously and um, have a stake in. And, you know, and, and that's the problem in my mind, really, because in, in a case that's being tried before you, um, your interest, that should not be such a force and such an interest in the litigation. It should be other matters. I have a question about <clears throat> the concept of having a committee or um, how that would work to have somebody reviewing budgets, uh, uh, reviewing vouchers. Um, I'm in a world where I uh, have had as many as 1,000, just as a single judge, 1,000 criminal cases a year. Um, and there are places like that. So when you talk about a committee, how do you find an unpaid group of people that, in, I have four district judges just in my district, um, that are going to want to review 4,000 vouchers a year, um, or um, is there some, and I'm just throwing this out, I, I certainly think, and I've heard of places where there are committees like that. I think there's one in New York City uh, that, that that may be workable, but I just, it's it's such a, it is a huge task to go through those vouchers, and um, to get somebody who wants to do that in, in an unpaid position, I just can't even imagine how, how you'd find people that wanted to spend that kind of time. Carlos said unpaid. He's asking me, like, I don't know. <laughs> so. I don't imagine. I don't think, I don't think you'll find somebody who will do it without pay. All right. That's, I guess that's my question. I mean, because it's one thing, whether you're an FPD or a judge, you're, you're, you're getting paid. Right. But to find some sort of a committee that would say, oh, okay, sure, we'll review 4,000, you know, vouchers a year, I, I think that would be a lot more. I think or a CJA committee, like you're, you're talking about. And the panels that I'm aware of that exist have federal defenders and CJA lawyers. I know our panel rep has, has suggested bringing into the process somebody from the outside criminal defense bar that isn't doing CJA. Um, and we have many fewer cases than you do in your district. And so, you know, even if we were to stay with the model where judges continue to deal with the vouchers, and I think that the committees that, that I'm aware of um, is there maybe one in Oregon or Seattle? I'm somewhere out in the, in the Northwest. There's one. Um, they may only deal with voucher cuts, 
Exactly. Right. Okay, so, um, but that doesn't resolve the front end problem of attorneys feeling like they're under pressure not to do the work. And so I think a lot of this is an education process. It's an education process of judges. It's an education process of the panel lawyers so that we can raise the level of practice through the performance standards understood both by the panel lawyers and by the judges and have committees that are reviewing the vouchers that are problematic. I still think even the vouchers that aren't problematic should probably should not be before, and the requests along the way for experts and investigators probably should not be before the judge that's presiding in the case. Um, but I do think that we have mechanisms that are available so that other judges might be able to do that um, and reserve the committee of unpaid you know, the volunteers to cases that are really problematic where a judge is inclined um, not to approve a voucher. Mr. Williams, anything else you'd like to tell us? Nothing else, I think. That's... Ms. Hunt, anything? No, thank you, Judge Driscoll. No. no, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. I think it was welcome. Ms. Ryan. No, thank you, Your Honor. All right, well, we're going to wrap up um, for now. Uh, I want to thank all of our panel for being here today. Um, again, the information is useful. If you get back home and you think of something that, or you get back to your rooms and you think of something you wanted to add, again, uh, we have a website that is available um, for you. Um, if you want to co communicate with us, uh, you can contact the committee, um, our, our um, uh, staff on the committee, but we want to thank you very much. We're going to take a short break and we're going to resume in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.